Okay, folks, I uh, hope you had a good weekend. Um, um, we will be finishing up with chapter 12 today. My hope is that we'll be finishing up with chapter 12 today. I've posted on Classroom for you um, uh, the enrollment information for Edmodo, and I've decided then that that's the um, and that's what we'll use for our, our exams and our quizzes. I will post a video, hopefully this afternoon, if not tomorrow, uh, explaining to you the procedures that we will use for the exams. And then what we'll do is um, hopefully tomorrow, um, uh, I'm gonna start chapter 12, uh, 13 tomorrow, but uh, that'll leave us some time on Wednesday so that um, I can, uh, at the end of the video tomorrow, I'll explain to you how we will do the review uh, procedures for. Um, the exam and so the exam for uh, chapter 12 will then be on Thursday okay so um, I'll explain the video to you um, uh, in the video I'll explain I'll, I will explain to you the testing procedures and uh, if we need to what I'll do is I'll schedule maybe a, um, a time uh, where we can practice what you would do on the exam just kind of get a, a, a practice run first and then we'll take the exam uh, if we have to, I'll move the exam till Friday, uh, but um, but the exam will be by the towards the end of this week. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you guys know uh, what we'll be doing moving forward in terms of the um, review, in terms of the uh, practice uh, exam practice that we may need, and then also in terms of the real exam that you will take uh, towards the end of the week. Okay, um, but my hope is that we can start chapter 13 uh, tomorrow, and um, and uh, get started with that, okay? All right, so with that said then, there's a little bit more information that we need to uh, go over with this chapter here. And um, and um, so let, let's go ahead. What I'd like to do then is use number 29 in your book. So we left off, I asked you to do that problem um, after the last lecture on Thursday. So I'm gonna go ahead and I, want, I would like to start with that particular problem here. And so what I'd like to do is I wanna work out for you uh, number 29. So if you have your paper out, go ahead and get this out and, and copy this down um, uh, and then and, and, um, and compare the work here with what you did on Thursday. Okay. All right. So we have a reaction that we were told then that iron three oxide, let's go ahead and write that down. So we have the reaction between iron three oxide in the solid state. We're going to react that with carbon monoxide. And we form here then the solid iron. So this is one way that you can get rid of rust, though not the best way. Carbon monoxide, remember, is a car, uh, poisonous gas. But it is, this is a way that we can get rid of rust. And uh, we'll form carbon dioxide in the process. Okay. So the balance equation then is going to be a 1, 3, uh, 2, 3 balance equation. So always get the balance equation first. Okay. All right, so with that said then, we are told, and let's and like I told you, I always like to kind of write this down to um, to help me here. Okay, so I would suggest you do this as well. That we are told that we start out with 84.8 grams of iron three oxide. Okay, we are told that carbon monoxide is in excess. This is given to us in the problem. Let's make sure we understand why this uh, this is important for us. We'll talk about it in just a moment. But, and so they're asking us to find the theoretical yield. This is, uh, so they're asking us to find the theoretical yield for iron. And remember, the theoretical yield is the ideal amount of product that we will form. This is the ideal amount of product that we form if everything is perfectly done. That is, if we live in a perfect world and this reaction was perfect and there are, there are no complications, there are no issues with the reaction, which we'll talk about in just a moment. We'll talk about why the actual yield, the amount that we actually expect to get, thus the actual yield will always be less than the theoretical yield. And so with that said, our percent yield will be lower. Okay, so we'll, we'll use that to talk about percent yields as well. But, um, but the actual yield is always less than the theoretical yield. What we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate for the maximum amount. So when they ask us to find the theoretical yield, what they're asking us to find then is the maximum amount of product that we can form if everything runs perfectly and if all of the limiting reagent is is completely used up okay all right so in these types of problems and remember our first step is then to find the limiting reagent we have to um we have to calculate the limiting reagent okay now for this particular problem it's going to be simple why because they tell us 
which one is in excess. They tell us that carbon monoxide is in excess. So if they give us the is in excess. So if they tell us that, folks, okay, and this is why it's important, we know then as a result, iron three oxide is the limiting reagent. It's the only other reactant that we have there, so it has to be the limiting reagent. Now, with that said, if you come across reactions, and you won't come across it in this class, if you come across reactions where you have two, uh, I'm sorry, if you have three pro, uh, reactants here, three or more, if you have three reactants here, if they give you the excess, they give you one of them as being the excess, you still have to calculate for the limiting reagents with the two that are remaining, but we don't have to deal with that issue here. Okay? All right, so with that said, then we can go ahead and go to the, uh, the second step, which is to calculate for the theoretical yield. And the theoretical yield is just the conversion. It's that stoichiometric conversion that we have learned in this chapter. This time, the stoichiometric conversion will involve a mass-to-mass -mass conversion. Why? Because we start out with this, a mass, 84.8 grams of iron three oxide. So we were given a mass of this particular component of the reaction. And we are asked to find the mass of this component of the reaction. So the conversion here is between the mass of iron three oxide and the mass of iron. Okay, so with that said, then I, I think this has become pretty uh, straightforward now. I think we'll only three conversion factors. The first one will be the molar mass of iron three oxide. Please make sure if you cannot get this, make sure you come by after school today and get that extra help. Okay. But the molar mass of iron three oxide, when you add two irons and three oxygen together, uh, it's going to be 160 grams. And remember, you can round this to the nearest whole number to make things easier for us. Okay. Okay. So molar mass is the first one. Second one, then, is going to be the mole ratio between the two components. And that's going to be uh, between the mole ratio between iron three oxide and iron, which is going to be a two to one mole ratio. Two on top, two to one, because we want to make sure then that iron is what we're gonna solve for, and then we can eliminate the moles of iron three, iron two oxide, iron three oxide, sorry, on the bottom, okay? So multiply by two, not divide by two, okay? So multiply by two, not divide, uh, multiply by one half, okay? All right, so with that said then, we need the molar mass of iron here, which is gonna be 56 grams, so we're gonna multiply by the molar mass, 56 grams per mole. Of iron, right? And so the, if you set it up that way, then um, everything cancels out. We end up with grams of iron on both sides. And, we, and with that said, then our final answer, when we plug in our numbers, is 59.4 grams of iron. This is the theoretical yield. This is the maximum amount of product that we will expect, the maximum amount of iron that we can expect if, we, if all 84.8 grams of iron three oxide is converted to iron. Okay, so this is our theoretical yield, okay, and this is, so we always have to calculate theoretical. We always have to calculate for this number here, okay. All right, so the actual yield, remember, that is going to be given to you in the problem because that's going to be a, an experimentally derived value, and so what you have to be able to do is be able to read the problem and identify the actual yield, okay. All right, so what do we do with this theoretical yield? Well, with this theoretical yield, then, uh, we're going to use that, and we're going to compare it to the actual yield. It gives us an idea of how good the reaction is, how good our work was. And so what are some reasons, then, why? And so hopefully you have this down. Please make sure you write this down. What are some reasons why, then, we would have a theoretical, um, an actual yield that is less than our theoretical yield? Well, first of all, the reaction, then, doesn't run to completion, meaning, then, if we keep this in mind, uh, there'd be issues, there'd be complications. For example, why wouldn't a reactor to completion? Well, first and foremost, there are maybe possibly other competing reactions. And this is always going to be an issue. We will expect one reaction to occur, but then because the, of the nature of chemical reactions, there are other reactions that will occur simultaneously that we are not aware of. So competing reactions would lead to not having the reaction that we wanted running to completion, okay? Furthermore, what happens is that the energy, if it is an exothermic, endothermic reaction, the energy is, is cut off, the energy is stopped. That is, 
you stop heating it. You stop uh, giving it uh, light energy. So you remove the energy. And if you do that, then the reaction will also stop. Many reactions will need energy in order to, to complete itself. So if it doesn't have any more energy, the reaction comes to stop. Okay, so that would be a second reason then why the reaction would not uh, uh, run to completion. Okay. All right. The another reason why the theoretical yield will be greater than the actual yield. That means you you get less product than what you expect. The reactants aren't pure, which means then what you had mixed together had other contaminants in it. And if there's other contaminants in it, then we're going to get these side reactions here, these competing reactions. And you want to think of these competing reactions then as, uh, and I'll just write this as last year, side reactions that'll happen. That is other reactions that we don't anticipate that will also react uh, happen. That will take away from what we think would happen. Okay, so the reactants are not pure. Okay, and if uh, you don't get pure reactants, you're going to have a very hard time uh, getting the amount of product you expect to get. Okay, all right. Why else then would? Oh, sorry about this one. Why else then would um, uh, we ex we would expect then less? Okay? You lose this. a lot of times when you run a chemical reaction. The pr there are other products that will form. There will be impurities that will form. Okay, and if there are impurities in there, we don't want that in there. And again, those impurities will rise as a result of impure reactions. Okay, and also these side reactions. So you'll get uh, other products. Okay? Other products will form. And so you want to clean it up. Okay, other products will form. And so you want to eliminate these other products. So you want to eliminate them and eliminate them. And in the process of eliminating these other products, these contaminants here, okay, eliminate them, you lose some of the product that you, you wanted to keep. And so therefore, if you're losing those product, uh, product that you wanted, you're going to have a lower uh, actual yield than your theoretical yield. Okay, so that's another reason why then you would have a smaller yield. Okay. All right. Okay. And then finally, uh, and then you you expect the reaction to run a certain way. You learn that a reaction will happen a certain way. You learn it in class. And folks, what you're going to make sure you understand then is what, what is described in textbooks. And for some of you folks uh, that are going to move on and do research, you're going to realize that, that some of the what is described in your textbook is the ideal case, that it always works, and, and that's what you're led to believe. When you actually carry out these reactions and you do the work in lab, things don't always work out the way that it's described in the book, and that's the issue there. So reactions don't always follow the, the process that you learned about in the textbook that you expect it to do. And so as a result then, and again, because of this, then we will have these side reactions that we do not uh, anticipate. So a lot of the reasons, uh, uh, many of the reasons why the actual yields are lower than, the, lower than theoretical yield because you have these competing reactions, okay? The re competing reactions that also occur, okay? All right, finally then, what you're gonna see then is that with um, the simplest reason why our actual yields are less than the theoretical yield, it's just human error. You transfer, um, um, the reaction you run, you, you don't, your glassware is not as clean. Um, so human error contributes most a lot of the times to the um, the lowering of the actual yield versus theoretical yield. Okay, all right. So those are some reasons, and those are some reasons and why we would see that happen. Okay. So what what can we do? Well, what we can do is we can. There is a measure that we can use that um, that will help us determine how well we did our work, and that's what we call this percent yield. Okay. And so with these percent yields, remember we already talked about this, the percent yield then is actually, you take the actual yield, you divide it by the theoretical yield, you multiply it by 100. 100% yield means that everything went perfect. And make sure you understand this, folks. Make sure you understand this. In lab, 100% yield, if you ever get that, th that, that would probably mean you should go back and check your work. 100% yield is never, is, cannot be obtained in, in real la uh, lab situations for the reasons I gave you on the previous slide, okay? And so um, we try to get close to 100% yield. It's ideal that we, uh, it's an ideal that we strive for, but it, it's very difficult difficult, and, and, and most of the time not, uh, I'm sorry, not most of the time, is not obtained. You can't obtain that percent yield, okay? 100% yield. And so we strive for 100, and there'll be many reactions you come across in which the percent yield would be fairly low, and that's expected. That's for those particular reactions, you get a very low percent yield. 
All right, so we got to calculate for these percent yields. Okay, so there are steps that you want to take here. These are the steps here. I think we, we've already talked about this. Don't memorize the steps. As you work through these problems, you'll learn these steps here. And so what I'd like to do is work through a couple problems with you that will ask us to find the percent yield. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at an example. Let's take a look at this example first. Okay, and so what I typically do is I go through and I, I highlight what is given here. Okay, so this is the reaction that's given to us. Okay, so we have that here. They actually give us the reaction, the decomposition reaction. Okay, um, make sure that it's balanced. Okay, and so if you check this really quickly, you'll see that it is also balanced. Okay, all right, so they are asking us for the theoretical yield here. They're asking us to find the theoretical yield of this particular compound, okay? And they give us then this amount of product to start out with. I'm sorry, reactant to start out with, okay? So we have 24.8 grams of um, calcium carbonate to, to start out with, okay? And so here, I hope that it becomes pretty apparent why we do not need to calculate for the limiting reagent. We can skip this uh, completely. Um, I'm sorry, let me go ahead. Oops. Okay. Uh, I hope it becomes pretty apparent why we do not have to calculate for the limiting reagents. So we can basically skip the first step here. And we can skip that because we only have one reactant, folks. This is a decomposition reaction. So because it's decomposition, okay, because it's decomposition, we only have one reactant. We do not need, no need to calculate for the limiting reagent. We do not need to calculate for the limiting reagent. And so this is good. We can just go ahead and uh, write that in. Okay, so we're gonna calculate for the theoretical yield, which means then this is a mass to mass conversion. Okay, so let's go ahead and just write this in. We have 24.8 grams of calcium carbonate to start out with. We are going to convert that to grams and they want us to solve for the calcium oxide here calcium oxide. So this is going to be our mass to mass conversion. Again, three conversion factors. I hope uh, at this point you're aware of why. So let's go ahead and plug in what we have. Uh, divide by the molar mass of calcium carbonate, which is going to be 100. So please make sure you calculate for that. So it's going to be one mole of calcium carbonate over 100 grams of calcium carbonate. Okay. Uh, the mole ratio, which is a one to one mole ratio, but let's go ahead and write that in. One mole of calcium oxide, one mole calcium carbonate. Okay, and then finally multiplied by the molar mass of calcium oxide, which is going to be 56 grams of calcium oxide, one mole of calcium oxide, which gives us a theoretical yield then for calcium oxide of 13.9 grams. Three sig figs again, folks, make sure you keep that in mind. Uh, keep sig figs in mind exam next, at the end of the week here. All right, so 13.9 grams, this is your theoretical yield. So this is what you had to calculate for. This is the ideal amount. This is the maximum amount of product that we can expect to obtain if everything goes well, okay? All right, so please make sure you write that down, okay? And so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what we can do with this, okay? okay. I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and with that said, if we know then that the uh, actual amount of calcium oxide that does form, okay, that does form is 13.1 grams, what can we do with this? Well, understand what they give us here then, what is given to us here is what's called the actual yield. So the actual yield is a, an experimentally derived value, which in the problems you have to do, they have to give it to you, you have to be able to identify it. So what they do here is they give you the actual yield. And the actual yield is 13.1 grams of calcium oxide. And what do they want us to do here? They want us to find the percent yield. They want us to find the percent yield. So this is what they want us to find. Okay? They give us the actual yield here of calcium oxide. And we calculated for the theoretical yield in the previous problem. So this is just a matter then of plugging it away, folks. This is a plug and chug problem. So they want us to find the percent yield of calcium oxide, which means then we need the actual yield of calcium oxide, which is given to us here. We need the theoretical yield of calcium oxide, which we calculated for in the previous problem. Okay, and we're gonna multiply that by 100, folks, and so let's go ahead and plug it in. So the actual yield here is 13.1 grams of calcium oxide. The, um, 
theoretical yield that we saw for in the previous slide was going to be 13.9 or is 13.9 grams of calcium oxide. We're going to multiply that by 100 to get our percent yield. Okay. And so we get a percentage in that is 94.2%. And what does this tell us? This is a pretty good reaction. That means then um, we get pretty close to 100%. So this is a very high yield for this particular reaction. Okay, so um, if we are able to obtain, you know, the people who ran this reaction, if they're able to obtain that amount, they did an excellent job because they got pretty close to 100%. Okay. All right. So with that said then, uh, what I would like you to do, so please make sure you write this down, okay? What I would like you to do then is, let's take a look at this next problem here. And I want you, just to finish out here then, I want you to um, work on number 13 here. We'll start with this problem tomorrow, okay? And so I'll, uh, again, I'll post the chapter 13, uh, chapter 13 material for you. My hope is that we can get started with that tomorrow. I'll also post a video for you of, um, of uh, the uh, procedures that we'll use for the exam, and that'll be posted for you tomorrow. And so please make sure you get this problem done here, and we'll finish up the chapter with this problem and a couple more problems just to help to practice with this. And so we'll start with this problem tomorrow, but I'd like you to work it out, uh, put it on your paper, and then submit it um, um, for the lecture material today, okay? All right, folks, so uh, good job. Um, hang in there, and I will see you uh, hopefully either after school today, 3.15 to 4.15, or, I'll, um, or uh, in the uh, lecture video for tomorrow, okay? All right, very good. So uh, have a good day, folks.